I would like to call to order this uh, meeting of the Senate Committee on Labor and Industrial Relations. Uh, good morning to all, and thank you all for being here. I want to thank you all for being in attendance on hearing this very important bill, SB3, by Senator Mark Leno. As everybody knows, the minimum wage is, very, is a very important issue for not only employers, but employees. It is clear from looking at the crowds that this issue is very meaningful to them. That said, we have already heard significant testimony in the Assembly on version SB3, as well as hours of testimony last year on the prior version of SB3. In order to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to testify, we will we're going to proceed in a timely manner. We are going to give five minutes for the people in favor and then five minutes for the people against the bill. And then we're going to just go ahead and show support uh, for each of the um, uh, groups by a show of hands to help expedite this. Again, thank you for, for in advance for sticking to these limits. And I will go ahead and ask uh, Senator Leno to begin to present his bill. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, before we do, uh, Senator, we're going to go ahead and ask for a roll call since we have a, uh, a majority. Mendoza? Here. Mendoza here. Stone? Here. Jackson? Here. Leno? Here. Mitchell? Here. We have a quorum. Yes, yeah, so and we have an assistant secretary here, uh, my daughter Anais, watching history with us, Anais Mendoza. So thank you. Go ahead, Senator Leno. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members and colleagues. You have already heard me present SB3, so I will step down from my soapbox and just tell you the differences between what's before us today and that which you had already passed out of committee last year, given that this is a two-year bill. So in some respects, this bill is a more modest proposal than the SB3 that you've already approved in that the original SB3 would have taken California's minimum wage to $13 an hour in 2017. This bill will take California's minimum wage to $13 an hour in 2020, but then has two additional steps to it. In 2021, it would go to $14 an hour. In 2022, it would go to $15 an hour. Different from the original SB3, this bill allows an extra year for small businesses to get to the $15 an hour rate. As with $13 an hour, that will also be one year later, 2021. There is also an adjuster once we hit the $15 an hour in 2022, 2023 for small businesses, tied to the federal CPI consumer price index. And irrespective of what the CPI may be in any one year, and it has been below this cap that I'm about to mention, which is 3.5%. So irrespective of how high the CPI might be in any one year, it would be capped at 3.5%. In recent years, it has been below 3.5%. Then there is also what's been referred to as off-ramps or a pause button, also not in the original SB3. And it authorizes the governor to suspend the climb up to 15 for one year if either of two tests are met. The first test is an economic test, the second is a budgetary, and either one can be met. The economic is if job growth for the previous three or six months is negative and retail sales tax receipts for the previous 12 months are negative. That would be the economic test. It can be used as often as the governor feels necessary until we reach the 15. Or the budgetary test, and that would be if the state is projected to have a budget deficit in the current year, current fiscal year, or either of the next two years, this pause button can only be twi used twice as we approach $15 an hour. So we have heard we had heard in assembly appropriations yesterday uh, questions such as, why $15 an hour? Why not 20? This is just an arbitrary number. And I would argue that it's not an arbitrary number. If we go back to the original SB3 at $13 an hour, our goal was, because it was introduced right after California raised its minimum wage 
our minimum wage from eight to ten dollars an hour, and that was passed by the legislature, signed by the governor in 2013, taking effect 18 months later. Our goal to get to 13, and the reason we wanted to go beyond the important incremental step of AB 10, is that even at ten dollars an hour today at $10 an hour, there are close to 2.2 million Californians working full-time jobs and living in poverty because $10 an hour is a sub-poverty wage. $13 an hour by 2017 would have gotten a family of four to about the federal poverty line. The federal poverty line itself is a very conservative measure of poverty because it doesn't account for the 30% higher cost of living that we have here in California, nor does it have even a line item recognizing the huge expense to families of childcare because that wasn't needed when the FPI, FPL was developed a half century ago. So we thought that's a conservative level uh, a measure of poverty. We think that a full-time wage earner in California should be at least there. So that was $13 an hour in 2017. To get to $15 an hour by 22, adjusting for inflation, it just about equates. It will still be at about the federal poverty line in 2022. So it, in, in my opinion, is not an arbitrary number. So those are the changes from the original SB3 to where we are today. There is one additional important addition to the bill before us, and that has to do with paid sick days. Uh, as a result of <laughs> Assemblywoman Lorena Gonzalez's good work, uh, workers in California do benefit from three paid sick days. Uh, as a result of budgetary concerns at the time, IHSS workers were carved out of that. This restores them to it, so they will be treated no differently than all the other workers. And I'm happy to take any questions. Of course, ask for your I vote. Thank you. And we'll go ahead and um, proceed to the witnesses in support. Again, uh, man, if you have five minutes, if you want to just two minutes each, that'd be great. And we'll get started. Thank you. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, I'll go really quick. It's great to see your daughter here today. Uh, this is really an historic day. It's really about the type of society uh, that we want to live in and the type of future that we want. So I think that's great that she's here to see it. Um, SEIU is proud to lead on this issue, um, on the fight for 15. I don't think I said my name, did I? Renee Bayardo. Um, <laughs> but SEIU is here in strong support. It's really a worker movement, and it's really about workers. So I'm going to turn the time over uh, to the worker that's here today to testify. Hello, everyone. My, my name is uh, Jody Simpson, and <coughs> I uh, am a housekeeper. I clean houses. I clean hotel rooms. And uh, right now, I can't work because I have the carpal tunnel. However, working, I'm still uh, not making it. I know today is the 31st because my budget takes me to the 30th. So today, I have to leave here and figure out what I'm going to do about toilet paper today. And, and I'm working. I like working. I'm not asking anyone to give me any money. I'm not trying to get on any programs. I just want to go to work, come home, and be able to sleep at night without having to get up in the morning and worry, what am I going to have today, okay? It doesn't seem like a lot to a lot of people, but when you live off of a $100 for the month after your bills, and I'm not talking about a car note, I'm talking about rent, PG&E, and SMUD, I don't even have cable. I have a government phone. I'm not talking about the extras. I'm talking about the basics, the bottom lines. I do not have enough. And I clean house. I notice how clean it is when you come through here. No cobwebs, garbage is empty, everything is nice. Those people are me. And every day she's probably going home and going to a second or third job just so she can get enough food to have macaroni and cheese and some oatmeal. So I'm just here. I'm not a politician. I'm just letting you know what's really going on. And I live on 3rd and Broadway. I don't live in another city or another county, a state. I live right down the road from here. And I'm going to stress about some toilet paper today. That's all I have to say. All right. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Uh, this, uh, hold up the applause, please. Just wave your hands if you support. 
Mr. Chair and members, Caitlin Vega for the California Labor Federation. It is an honor to be here today. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, that is the story of millions of California workers. And this bill is going to go a long way to addressing what we all know and what you all know as members of Labor Committee who hear these stories throughout the year um, really is the greatest challenge we face as a state, which is the record levels of economic inequality and the fact that our economy relies on these low wage jobs that do not ever provide a path out of poverty for workers. So this action you're taking today will have a significant impact on millions of workers' lives. We're here in strong support. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, the, all the, I would just going to go to the audience. All the audience who's in support, just raise your hands like this. And we're going to go ahead and uh, begin with the opposition. If you could step forward. Oh. Okay, one more, because I think we're still another five minute limit. Yeah. Okay. It's broad. Is this on? Oh, yeah. Very broad on behalf of the Teamsters and the Machinists, Longshoremen, Amalgamated Transit Union, utility workers, number of unions. I just want to make a point about the index. Um, I used to, I was appointed by Governor, uh, uh, Governor Davis to serve on the Industrial Welfare Commission. So I voted on minimum wage increases. And I've been involved in this issue for more than 30 years. And the politics of this are very stressful. And here's why. The minimum wage goes up after a big campaign for it to go up. And then there's, there's opposition to it. And time passes, and it starts to lag, and it lags, and it lags, and it lags. And then when the, when the political pressure builds up to raise it, um, it, then the increase tends to be big, and the employers get very stressed out by it. It's my experience, having actually been the policymaker, it's similar to you in this circumstance, that were the minimum wage to go up more frequently, but in much smaller increments, it wouldn't be such a shock to the system. It's an inherently poor way of doing it based on going from crisis to crisis after the thing builds up for many more years beyond when it should, so that the increases are, are large by percentage, but years have gone by without any increase. So I think this is actually wise public policy. And frankly, I think once it's done and over, um, you know, 15 years from now, we'll, I, I, my prediction is that we'll have employers saying we would prefer it this way. So I urge an I vote. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate the, the first group. They kept it on their four, uh, under five minutes. It was actually four minutes and 44 seconds. Appreciate that. We'll go ahead and start with the next group of the opposition. Please uh, proceed. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator and members. Greg Hayes with KP Public Affairs on behalf of the California Restaurant Association. And again, we'll respect uh, the desire to be brief. The uh, few points I want to make are, number one, this is a fairly grand experiment. Uh, there are frequently cited studies by the proponents. Of course, the opponents have studies as well. Uh, that show differing impacts, but no one has come close to studying the magnitude of this increase. Uh, so to then say the uh, results will be X, Y, or Z, it's truly not known because nobody has studied the magnitude of this increase. So that is a, that is a challenge, and we won't know the outcome until it actually occurs, uh, positive or negative. Uh, and it, it should be known that there will be winners and losers when it comes to the outcome. Uh, we know this already. The winners will be people whose wages will be increased. We know that uh, some of them are in this room, many of them have testified on this bill, but there will be losers as well, and those are the people without jobs. Many industries in California will have to shift to automation, and uh, the job losses are not calculated again because they haven't been studied. The last thing I'll say is, uh, it has been noted uh, that there will be a very significant cost to the state uh, to the tune of about $4 billion. If you were to look at what could benefit uh, many of the people who are uh, being sought to, to benefit by this uh, increase, if you were to take a step back and say, okay, if the state is going to be investing $4 billion in this increase, what are some other things that we could be doing? I mean, the reality is, as you know, the saying goes, 
when you have uh, a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. We are looking at this through one lens, which is the lens of a minimum wage increase. There are other things that can be done, like a renter's tax credit or an earned income tax credit. If the state is going to be making an investment, what would be the outcome of doing those types of things? It hasn't been studied. Right? Uh, we could increase the renter's tax credit. We could expand the earned income tax credit uh, to benefit many of the people being sought to benefit by this program. If you were to compare those side by side, that would be an interesting uh, uh, initiative to undertake before you hit the button on this particular increase. So uh, we would urge your no vote. We would urge uh, to slow down slightly and let's take uh, a better and more analytical look at uh, this bill. Thank you. Jennifer Brewer, oh, thank you. Jennifer Brewer, on behalf of the California Chamber of Commerce, we are opposed and have identified it as a job killer this year. I was unfortunate to miss the presentation, but I had heard the presentation yesterday, and so I'm just going to address some of the points. Uh, California has different labor markets in different regions. While our state may be enjoying a low unemployment rate overall, there are still many regions in the state that have double-digit uh, unemployment rates. And to impose a $15 minimum wage on those employers who have not been able to create jobs and reduce that unemployment level with a $10 minimum wage increase, it it brings concern that they'll be able to do the same with the $15 minimum wage increase. There's just some areas of the state that can't assume that cost. Uh, the other point that I wanted to make is that I've heard this is going to be an economic stimulus, that employers are actually going to make money because more people will be spending money at their places of uh, business. If that were true, then I would have all of our employers asking us to support this measure because businesses are in, in business to make profit. But nobody's doing that because they know that the reality is they can either pass on part of this to their consumers, but there's a limit at that. It's not all their consumers. They can uh, afford a higher price, and so there will be a, come a point when they will lose uh, customers. But they also know that they have to make cuts everywhere. Everybody in, this, in, uh, in, the, in the legislative body, including our budget chair, um, knows that when you have lower revenues and you have higher pressures on costs, you have to make cuts somewhere. Labor cost is one of your highest costs in business, and so they may have to, in fact, raise higher prices and make cuts everywhere. So there could be uh, job losses as well. The Wall Street Journal came out yesterday and said it would be a 700,000 job loss. I don't know if that's true or not, but there is a concern that that could happen. My other point to this is, uh, that there's no need to rush it so fast. Look, I get there's a ballot initiative out there. We have until June uh, to remove that from the ballot. And if you pass it today, if you pass it next week, that increase is still not going to go into effect until January of next year. So you have several months to try and mitigate some of these unintended consequences, some of these potential job losses, if you sit and deliberate and actually think about some other provisions that can be added to this bill to mitigate those unintended consequences. And for those reasons, we are opposed. Thank you. Mr. Chair, members, Chris McKaylee on behalf of the California Ambulance Association, we're an industry that is largely dependent upon the state and we look at the cumulative impacts of all of the costs associated with running a business in the state of California. We provide more than 80% of the 911 transports and yet we are dependent upon very low reimbursement rates by Medi-Cal. So every time that the state enacts new costs, an increase in labor costs, an increase in ACA compliance, worker comp, et cetera, all of those have a very bad cumulative impact on our industry. Uh, obviously, you can't amend the bill, but as Ms. Barrera indicated, you certainly have until sufficient time the next three months, till June 30th, before these measures are certified. Why don't we address some of these uh, issues? Why not look at a uh, regional measure? We have more than a dozen counties already that ha still have double-digit employment, despite the uh, single-digit unemployment statewide rate. Uh, we have no local preemption uh, in this measure. Uh, even smaller things like the small business definition that was raised in committee yesterday. In searching through the codes yesterday, we find definitions of 150. Nowhere is it as low as 25 that's contained in this bill. Uh, so for those reasons, we remain opposed. Thank you. Thank you so much. I uh, appreciate you uh, sticking to the time. It means a lot. Uh, with that, I want to go ahead and open it up to committee. If you have any, uh, we have Vice Chair Stone that... Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, one of the concerns I have is that what was talked about was the uh, the fiscal impact of the state that was estimated at $4 billion. By my calculations, it's more between 5 and $6 billion. If you look at the cost of IHSS uh, compaction that we're going to have to deal with in the state, uh, exempt employees now are going to go from $20 an hour ultimately to $30 an hour, the high price for, for child care. And, uh, and certainly the cost for the uh, the three sick days. Has, has Is the Department of Finance here to, to weigh in on the uh, fiscal uh, impacts to the state? Yes, she's here. Good. Good morning, Kristen Shelton, Department of Finance. 
Um, the fiscal impacts from a general fund standpoint when this bill is fully implemented is going to be about $4 billion general fund. Um, there's also some other fund impacts for various special funds within the state. The first year costs, though, are only about $20 million general mm -hmm. fund. Okay. And have we figured out how we're going to pay for this in the long term, or is that something that's going to have to be taken up during the budget period? It, um, we will evaluate that during our May revision update, um, and we will also be looking at and evaluating um, how this looks in more of the long-term view. As um, Senator Leno mentioned, one of the off-ramps does include um, potential yeah. to turn things off if the budgetary impacts um, exceed um, or cause a deficit for the state. Thank you. And then, uh, Senator Leno, I think it's, it's very noble. Uh, that we want to uh, eliminate poverty in the state of California. And I know you believe that this is a, a mechanism uh, to get us there. And, uh, and you reside in a county that uh, has very high cost of housing, very high cost of, of wages, high cost of living. Um, I come from the inland counties where minimum wage is still uh, very difficult for many of our businesses to, to comply with. Uh, my sister county, uh, Imperial County, still has unemployment in excess of 21%, as well as we've heard of nothing another 12 12 counties. Um, in our staff report, 75% of economists were consulted with this, and they say that this is going to end up costing jobs, not creating jobs, and won't have an effect on, on poverty like you had hoped. I just wanted to get your perspective on that. Uh, I know that you truly believe that it will help, and, 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 I, and, I, and I understand, and I appreciate all the people that are here today that want a better life for themselves and a better life for their families. But when I see people like Bill Gates that say, um, be careful when you raise the minimum wage because it's going to force employers to utilize technology that's become less expensive, such as Amazon hiring uh, robots to do picking. Uh, I just saw an app for Starbucks where you can actually place your order on your cell phone. You just walk up your orders there and you, you pay for it with your cell phone. I worry that technology is going to replace some of these jobs that these people really want to keep and, and work hard. So there's a lot of different elements yeah. to your question. Let me just address a couple of them. With regard to technology, there is nothing that can slow it down. And yeah. I would argue strongly that another dollar, two, three, or five over seven years is not going to impact the rate at which technology is advanced. Mm -hmm. It's happening. Mm -hmm. And we, if we could adjust it no. so that it has different impacts on our workforce, <coughs> we would, but we can't. It's just a fact of life. So I don't think that our... I don't think our minimum wage is one of the components that impacts the advance of technology. It's interesting to note that, and I recognize, of course, that there are differences in employment rates across the state. And I'd be very happy to work with you and all of our colleagues to see, especially as this, should it pass and move forward, is implemented, to see what ways we can incentivize businesses to locate in some of these more challenged parts of our state. But whether I, as a worker, live in Imperial County or in San Francisco County, where there are differences in cost of living, I don't believe that if I'm working a full-time job, I should be living below a federal poverty line, which, as I described earlier, is a very conservative measurement of poverty. And whether it's just above or below, as the worker who was just here testified, people are struggling and suffering and feeling grounded, grinded down by the impact of poverty. And I've seen too many studies that show the impact of chronic poverty on children and on families. It can impact brain development of children. It's cruel. And I don't believe that this bill will end poverty in California, no. Mm. But I do believe it can stimulate the economy. We've already seen it. And with regard to some of the concerns <coughs> and some of the con that we've heard from the opposition as well as from you, Senator Stone, I don't discount anything. And I believe that there are precautions in the bill that give the governor authority to be able to pause the right. incremental increases as determined and as necessary. But keep in mind, we the legislature, by the same simple majority vote that can pass SB3 today, 
can either repeal it or amend it at any time going forward if the unintended consequences are such that we feel we must. So things are not out of our control, they're very much in our control. But how do we incentivize businesses to come to other parts of the state that are not benefiting right now? But curiously, not only have we seen almost a 2% drop in our employment rate as the, yeah. un, as the minimum wage went from eight to $10 in real time before our very eyes in the past 20 months, <laughs> we've seen it happen. So you've got studies, we've got studies, we don't have to look at studies. What's happened in the past 20 months? Senator General, thank you so much for taking time to answer some of those questions. I think we're, we're going to, I think we have one more. We might get to everybody, have a chance to <coughs> say a few words, and we'll start to go to the Senator Mitchell. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. First of all, let me move the bill and just make two very brief comments. I don't intend to speak on the floor. Um, as we have the conversation about technology, I think that we have to acknowledge some of the lowest wage earners in the state are people who care for people on both ends of the spectrum, from child care to elder care to those in-home support care workers who, who support the infirmed and the elderly. And technology will never replace the kind of work they do, human to human care every day. And so we've got to be clear about what technology can do and what it never will. I think that's only fair. Secondly, I think some of the uh, issues the opposition raised are fair, and we as a policy setting and policy making body will continue to have the debate and the conversation about what uh, the impacts it will have on the state to increase wages across time. I think it's, it's important that we have clear, accurate conversation to suggest that perhaps increasing the EITC, a one-time shot, a reimbursement perhaps in the spring, is a better and more sound investment than increasing what someone earns every month of every, every day of every month of the year is just not a fair comparison. So I think it's important. We have the opportunity to have ongoing conversation about what's most appropriate to invest, to support working families in the state of California. But even when we do that, it needs to be fact-based and accurate. With that, again, Mr. Chair, I move the bill. Great, thank you Mr. so much, Chair, Senator one, one Mitchell. Comment, and now we have Senator Jackson. And Very briefly, I want to uh, uh, second that, that notion that I believe that there are some good suggestions that, that the business community can bring forward. I, I believe that $10 an hour, $10.50 an hour, even $11 an hour, and as we move to 2023, uh, at $15 an hour, we're still going to be right at the poverty level. No one's getting rich off of this. And so I think it is important, and I look forward to discussions coming from the business community about other ways that we can uh, improve the lives of these hardworking people so that they aren't working so hard and still living right at the poverty level. That's not what the American dream is all about. It's that hard work, playing by the rules, doing your best, Everybody should have a crack at the, the brass ring, if you will, the American dream. And even what we're doing here today isn't going to give people that opportunity in 2023 at $15 an hour. We have got to do uh, more, and we've got to do better, and I look forward to the business community being part of that solution. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, debate has been seized. Uh, Senator Denno, we're going to go ahead and motion has been made. Uh, I ask for you. I vote. Thank you so much. With that, Madam Secretary, please call the roll. The motion is that the assembly amendments be concurred in. Mendoza? Aye. Mendoza, aye. Stone? No. Stone, no. Jackson? Aye. Jackson, aye. Leno? Aye. Leno, aye. Mitchell? Aye. Mitchell, aye. Great. Has four votes. The bill is out. Goes to the floor. Thank you.